to Nile. Um, one of the things that surprised me very much when I started working in Food City is to see that you have websites dedicated um, to denying the, the Holocaust. And it's also a very important element in current day anti Semitism. Um, and particularly in, in, in Netherlands, we can see that extreme right wing groups are increasing and getting more active. And they cannot leave this point of Holocaust and all behind. So all these de growing and new groups of extreme right wing formations, mainly on the countryside, so outside of the big cities, always have this element of Holocaust now uh, in their ideology or in their expressions, always. Um, but it's not the extreme right wing groups only. You can see that the anti-Semitism, Holocaust now, is rising in all sections. Okay, even among, uh, um, also among other groups, you can see now elements of Holocaust now of uh, or saying, well, it may be, uh, it, okay, it happened, but uh, they shouldn't be, uh, uh, should they still be talking about it? Should they still be worried about it? Should they still be, of course, and this is, these kind of expressions can only uh, uh, start, can only um, uh, come into being because you have one groups, groups actively denying the Holocaust. So one group is actively denying the Holocaust, other groups are saying, well, I'm not denying the Holocaust, but even uh, even if they happen, or okay, it happened, but and then they start criticizing Israel in a way that could be, or something many times because it is a semantic in nature. The problem also is, of course, that the memory of the Second World War is decreasing in new generations of teenagers. Um, most high school uh, students, um, well, it's, it's, of course, it's very it's a very natural phenomenon. Further something that passed is away, the easier it is also for people to forget uh, the details, the, 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 uh, don't hear the memories anymore of the parents or the grandparents, etc, etc, etc. So it's getting further and further past, which is also, so it's also then easier for Holocaust deniers to spread their message, because current uh, groups of teenagers, of uh, students, are less informed. Uh, Holocaust deniers are usually, uh, have some certain techniques in which they uh, have like certain details correct, but then uh, come with illogical conclusions. Okay, so for people who have uh, a small background knowledge, who don't have uh, people with strong memories on the Second World War, it's easier to to dilute this this uh, um, uh, uh, this message, this this happening of the Holocaust. Finally. There are increasing students of non-Western backgrounds. Many uh, Turkish, Islamic, African immigrants, children of these immigrants, are wondering, why should I learn about the Second World War? Why should I learn about the Holocaust? What does it matter to me? We didn't do it. So they all already have like a different, different uh, um, standing in this, this historic narrative. Okay? For Dutch students, it's part of their history. But for the Im children of immigrants, it's part of their history. We didn't have anything to do with it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Okay, that, that, this, is, this is very problematic. Of course, if you talk about anti-Semitism, I wrote the report. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot of work. It's been uh, gathering all this data, collecting all this data, <coughs> talking with all these people, uh, helping them whenever possible. And then we have numbers we can send to the press, to the politicians. They hope that something happens. <coughs> of course, C is also trying to do something themselves. <coughs> yeah? And we think that uh, um, bringing teachers to Yad Vashem was one of the things we could do to counter anti-Semitism, to counter Holocaust denial, <coughs> to counter the spread of intolerance in Dutch society. So last week, we were here with the first Dutch group of teachers in Yad Vashem. And I was surprised to hear that we were the first group, uh, and that other groups other countries have, have been sending groups of teachers for five years, six years, seven years, ten years. Liechtenstein has been sending uh, uh, history teachers for, for years. Belgium, England, France, Russia, Ukraine, England, and the Netherlands. Very interesting. Netherlands, 
is not participating in all these uh, uh, groups of teachers that are being sent to Yad Vashem to study about the Shoah, to learn about the Shoah, and to think of how to transmit this knowledge, this information, to a current day Dutch uh, context. It's very interesting. So that's what we've been trying to, uh, what we're trying to do right now. We had the first pilot group uh, last week. Of course, we, did, we didn't organize it by, completely by ourselves. We worked together with the Underfront Foundation and the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And what they do, try to do uh, Yad Vashem, is familiarizing 25 Dutch school teachers with new instructional means and methods about the Holocaust. And of course, you have to find a way to uh, um, have non-Jewish teachers teach about the Holocaust to non-Jewish students in a way that's also uh, relevant for everybody. It's, it, it's a hard balance sometimes to find, I have to say, because it's, of course, the show is part of our history, and it's part of our future. Um, on the other hand, for these non-Jewish teachers, non-Jewish students, you also have to make it a part of their past and their future. And there's, it's hard to, it's hard to sometimes to find this balance and to find ways how to, to bridge this gap. One of the ways, of course, by doing this is stressing the importance of fighting racism and understanding the value of human rights. This is something we try to put in, in this understanding of the show, in this fighting, uh, in this transmitting of knowledge, uh, in the hope that uh, my report next year will be easier to write because I'll have less uh, incidents. Um, so we'll see how it will develop if, uh, um, um, if the Dutch government will keep on sponsoring these uh, um, groups of teachers. We already got uh, the message that will be sponsored for a second trip. And of course, what we hope is that the Netherlands, just like all other <coughs> West European countries and some East uh, European countries will keep on sending groups of teachers to Yad Vashem so we can deal with anti-Semitism not in a report, that's of course where everything already mm -hmm. happened, but deal with it in a classroom. So uh, finally, I hope to see, let's see if I can show a, a short uh, it's, it's all right. I want to show uh, a small video clip that's been uh, uh, made by Haaretz on this teacher seminar, but I can see that the uh, connection broke down, so I think I have to leave it with this. Um, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay, we'll take questions. Yes. Yeah, well, you can see it on the Haaretz website. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the Kina. Uh, and I want to just make a very short remark. I think. Uh, thanks, a, thanks a lot. I talk to the rabbi who is in charge of, in fact, the whole of the Netherlands outside the state. And he says he cannot come to a station, a, 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 a train station, without being insulted. On the other hand, it's impossible today to be in the Netherlands for him with his Chabad uh, costume uh, to be on a train station without being insulted. On the other hand, he says, I cannot sit in a train without somebody coming up to me uh, and saying shalom whom I don't know. So he says the thing is totally polarized in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. but obviously the negative thing weighs infinitely more heavy. Now, if you have every time that he is insulted, if you have to put that up there, uh, your figures go up. By the way, your figure in 2004 is underestimated by Bam because I sat in an Amsterdam uh, tramway and a uh, Moroccan kid started to sing Jews you have to kill but it is forbidden. So uh, you must re retroactively correct, uh, correct the statistics. Uh, I'll get the details later on in the future. I have a problem with the numbers because uh, you mentioned in one of the slides the anti-Semitic um, events worldwide in 2006 were 590. 509. 509. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So there must be something with the criteria wrong, but if you have in Holland 261, which would mean about 35% of all the events in the world would be in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look to me that way. I think this number in, in France is uh, hundreds. 
Oh, so this yeah, is yeah, violent, yeah. violent incidents. Right. Right. There must be something with the criteria. I think it's only yeah. violent uh, incidents. Yeah. I think but the Netherlands contributed three, which seems reasonable. Yeah. 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 No, but it's true. There's a big problem with um, comparing all this data. I've, I, I had an appointment yesterday at the Stephen Roth Institute to talk about this issue. Because, of course, um, Every country, every organization has its own categories, its own ways of counting. Um, and of course, it would be very convenient if we would have like um, a, a more uh, uniform method of counting, of uh, uh, um, um, getting uh, putting the figures together. Um, we're working on it. That's why I was at the uh, Stephen Rothenstein yesterday. Uh, well, we talked about some details, and uh, but it's, it's something that's I th I think should be would be very important to do. I agree. I really think it should be more and more. Um, but you also have to deal with local factors. For instance, in Netherlands, you have loads of local anti-discrimination bureaus, which cover all fields of discrimination: anti-Semitism, racism, discrimination, uh, age, um, gender, everything. But they also have different ways of counting. And of course, we also try to work with, together with them. So it's, uh, I'm trying now to find a balance between this, the Dutch context, the Dutch way of the way that the, uh, the Dutch anti discrimination bureaus are counting, and the way that Stephen Roth and students would love, would love, uh, like me to, have, uh, to count. So, um, and of course, it's the problem they have for Stephen Roth is really complex because they have to deal with England, with France, and Germany, with all the different ways of counting. And, um, but I agree, it's problematic, and we should uh, we should get it on some level. It should be like more uniform, so we could really, really compare very well. So we know that when we're talking about statistics, that we are seeing the same things. Yeah. And what Cohen and Professor Pierre and Yusuf If I was a statistician, I would say that the numbers that you gave yeah. actually are very optimistic, because from 2000 to 2007. Years, four years, every year they've gone down except for 2006 when they jumped up because of the Lebanon War. So you could say that was the exception, and the trend is very positive. Of yeah. course, if you compare it to 2005, it's, it's uh, an upper trend. If you compare to, if you look at it, all, all the numbers go down every single year from 2007. Yeah. 2002. It's true. I heard this also from uh, one of the journalists I, I spoke with, and it's, I think it's correct if you look from 2002. The thing, of course, also is that 2002 was the absolute peak year. It was dramatic. In this year, quite some families made Aliyah because they were like so tired of being insulted and harassed on the streets. This was the absolute peak year of anti-Semitism in the Netherlands since the Second World War. So maybe I should, in another presentation, I should go back until, let's say, 1995, so that you can get a good, clear picture of the upward trends with the peak in 2002 and then uh, from 2002 to now a, a downward trend. Yeah. Yeah. One more comment. Um, on a definition of anti Semitism, uh, not being original, many people have a feeling of sympathy. Yeah. Um, the definition of anti Semitism when it's anti Israel yeah. is when the criticizer is only criticizing Israel. Criticizing everybody who's doing equally bad things, let's say, yeah. assuming that we do bad things, uh, then you would say that's legitimate criticism. When you pick from one country, then that clearly is anti Semitism, and Durban is the best example. Mm -hmm. But also in Durban, of course, you also made a reference to the Second World War, to the, uh, uh, to the Germans. And, and, and these kind of expressions, that will clearly c uh, clown, uh, count as anti Semitic. So uh, if we have one person constantly criticizing Israel without being as insulting or abusive to uh, uh, Jewish institutions, symbols, whatsoever, we'll leave it at that. We'll, we won't count that because we try to really, that's like the, we try to be like, uh, keep it as, as calm as possible. Of course, it's, it's one of the problems we have is that you have many particular persons, uh, especially from the left wing, who are very articulate, have, uh, uh, um, uh, very keen observations, but only in Israel. It's, it's a, a tough issue to deal with, but as, as long as we don't see the uh, stereotype anti-Semitic 
uh, um, expressions, then we won't count it. So. I would like uh, to know more about uh, about uh, this discrimination. Uh, are we talking about say somebody applying for a job and uh, having the qualifications and so on, and then um, and then uh, claiming he was not. Uh, Yeah, that's true. It's very problematic, and that's something I have to make sure. I have to make sure this person is not using me, is not using right. CD as a way to uh, uh, achieve his own goals, getting a job. Where uh, some people are Jewish, and because they are, uh, have uh, experienced some opposition, they say, "Ah, it's anti-Semitism." We have to make very sure that it's clearly anti-Semitism, and we do that by looking at expressions. Um, as I said, like uh, comp comparison with Nazis, of course, is a very easy one. Uh, using curses while talking about Jews is a very easy. It's very easy. Uh, I always prefer getting faxes with clear, uh, as clear uh, 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 expressions as possible. It's like, oh, okay, that sounds nice. I put it in my archive, and I'm, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to. Uh, 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 think and like see is it really anti or not. The tough cases are when you are not completely sure when you have to really go into the issue and see is it anti-Semitism or not. It's like, you know, I, I prefer the, the faxes from extreme right groups. Right. You know, if, if as a as a research in anti-Semitism, I prefer those faxes, rather those faxes or, or, or media expressions from uh, left wing politicians mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. let's say <coughs> Public figures who are just saying something without really been looking into the issue. These are the tough cases to, to deal with. Huh? But I can give you an example of something what happened, uh, what we would count as work related. Okay, uh, in 2006. Um, 15 September 2006. It was. Um, It's called, uh, if people cannot get a job, you have like speci special places where they can still do some jobs uh, be, uh, uh, um, before they get a, can get a like, real paid job. So it's, uh, they receive some welfare, but in the meantime they have to do some, some easy jobs, okay? Um, on this department there's a letter circulating that's uh, um, addressed to this Jewish, uh, it's addressed to all the people working there and it's about this Jewish person working there. In this letter, they're spoken about liquidation, deportation, and uh, 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 the Jewish uh, uh, Jewish person was experienced this letter as uh, highly insulting and uh, uh, calls Sidi uh, to help him deal with this this woman who's been. He was mentioned by name, or was or not? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. She was clearly re referring to this one Jew working there, and she was, uh, this, this woman actually who sent this letter referred to all these things of the Second World War, and uh, was highly offended when CD called this uh, uh, company to, to, uh, because we wanted to get some apologies, we wanted to have, make sure this person would be uh, reprimanded. She was offended. She didn't understand why he, th he felt it to be uh, uh, offensive or whatsoever. So um, this is one of the, the cases we took into our point. And that's very clear. It's not somebody who's saying, oh, it's a, no. uh, We have Yusuf, then we have Abidana Shechta, and Dr. Shalom. OK, I, I am puzzled as to how you combine your report. In other words, what criteria do you use? One of uh, my wife's niece's husband was yes. in the Netherlands. Yes. And somebody was making fun of his people. Yeah. Do you consider that an incident of any semitism? Is that, is that going to go that or, or it has to be something physical, something like uh, beating somebody or firebombing the building or something like that? Well, we report that, insults as well. So. Okay, if you report insult, then I think that your report is way underrated that probably in one year, more than 300 times, because 
you know, some other place in the dance mm. It's quite common to laugh at <coughs> Jews. Yeah. I'm talking about most Eastern mm -hmm. cultures. Yeah. Okay, so that's 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 one question that I have. And the other one is Can I first answer the first one? First please, one? Yes, yes. Okay, so we have a definition of anti Semitism that we use in uh, um, checking if we should take the take the report uh, into if we should take put in our reports. Our definition is uh, the different treating Jews differently as a person or as a group than other people or uh, groups, in uh, particularly um, being hostile to Jews on, uh, on grounds of prejudices. Okay. Um, in this case, what do they say exactly, exactly about the kippah? If the, uh, if there were some stereotypes to uh, being uh, uh, obsessed with money, if there were some references to the Second World War. If there were some references to, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, 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 many more things, <laughs> and I hate to call to, to mention, but if there were references to these kind of things, and the person also feels offended, then he can report it. That's the problem, of course, with discrimination. Uh, it's something that people sometimes experience. Um, uh, sometimes they don't. I mean, for instance, I went to a, a bar and I took off my cap. So the person, the, the bartender, so I had a keeper, and he ordered a whiskey, like whiskeys, and um, uh, he gave me a big one. He said, "Wow, ah, it's, it's a double one, but you can you, you can surely pay that." Is it anti-Semitism or not? Of course, they, you have the stereotype in it. Okay. I think that that's anti-Semitism. The stereotype is in it. Uh, I'm, I'm clearly recognizable. There's a stereotype in it, but he he, he really tried to make a, a joke, and I didn't feel offended because I know I knew beforehand that he wanted to make a joke because he was laughing, you know. So I could see it coming. Okay, so I didn't take it as being uh, anti-Semitic, but I'm sure that <coughs> another person could definitely say this is anti-Semitic if he would be feel feel offended and wouldn't uh, uh, see it like as being like uh, a case of you were, we, we, could, we would have counted this expression. If we just be kidding, like, hey, what do you have on your head? You know, you, uh, just to cover your bald head, you know, it's, it's not anti semitic. I think. Okay, the second, the second part that I wanted to say was that, look, the Catholic Church, and maybe I should not say the Catholic Church, but uh, <coughs> known historically. I call Pope Pius XII and Pius XII because mm. you know it's anti-Semitism is obvious. Mm. Okay, that's one. And another one is in new Nazi groups. Yeah. Another one is the far left, which made now the, 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 the all uh, the hearts are bleeding for the poor Palestinian and the Jews are at home. All minority right. groups except the Jews, basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the other ones are Muslims. Which one of those is in the forefront of the anti-Semitism. Uh, well, they have their work division. You know, uh, the, the Muslims uh, harass you on the streets uh, with uh, insults and with stones or uh, pushing and these kind of things. That's what the, the Muslims do. The right wing, they like to do to demolish stuff and uh, violate uh, monuments. And the left wing, they like to uh, um, uh, write anti-Israel emails and uh, these kind of things. So they have like a work division. So it's, I'm, I'm not sure if they organize this, but there's, there's clearly some division here in, in the preferred strategy in the spreading of something. Yeah. But wait a moment. Your figures over the last six years show that 60% yeah. of the violent incidents come from white Dutch and 40% come from Muslims. Yeah. So you still have violence. Uh, okay, there are far more white people in the Netherlands than there are Muslims. But still, uh, you have 60% uh, white people who, uh, who, who are in behind the violence. Um, yeah. That's your but these, statement. these, yeah. Okay, but these numbers are from only from the categories where you can clearly tell that the perpetrator was uh, had a, a Muslim or Arab appearance or a Dutch appearance. Okay, so these are only a couple of categories. But because from email, from some yeah. categories, it's hard to tell. No, but we speak about the. The violence and the, the strong verbal insults. Yes. That are your figures consistent except for the last year. Mm. 
so you still have fight violence. Oh, definitely. I'm not denying that you don't have uh, violence from uh, the local Dutch population. But I'm saying that uh, the most of it really comes from the, the Arab. Minority comes from the Arab. Of course, if the, the, in the Netherlands, the two, two percent Moroccans, and they account for 40 percent of the violent yeah. incidents, it's an enormous percentage of the Arab But the majority are right. You've got to do your own statistic. Yeah, we have. Uh, Actually, okay, if, if you count, sure. So like in last year, it's like 33.5% is what we call f uh, of, of the face-to-face uh, -face contact was from uh, North Africans. Uh, we call it North Africans. It's more politically correct. And I'm sorry. So 33.5%. So of course, relatively to the... To the uh, to, to 2 the, percent represented the Exactly. So that's that's what I'm saying. That's what they because you don't see them violating synagogues or uh, monuments so much. Okay. Well, that's what you. That's what revenues prefer. So that's what I'm saying. You have to like a division of labor in this respect. I have a quick follow-up question. Okay. Okay. In America, yes. especially among the Iranian uh, Muslim community, yes. there is a lot of assimilation, a lot of intermarriage. Is that happening in Europe also? Um, I can only tell for uh, from the, from the Netherlands, but I would. Uh, well, my feeling is that there's a lot of assimilation in the Dutch uh, society, in the Dutch, the Dutch Jewish population. I would, I would definitely think so. But I'm maybe not only Jews. I'm talking about Muslims. Um, not, not definitely not the Turkish. No, the Moroccans. No, Moroccans actually intermarry more than the, than the it's Turkish. Marginal. Of course, yes. They they really really um, <coughs> Dutch government has been legislating has been uh, um, new criteria to immigrate to have uh, uh, to to import brides or bridegrooms. They're new criteria now. Why? Because Turkish and Moroccan people uh, never married with somebody from in the Netherlands. Always with somebody from Turkey or Morocco. So that's why the Dutch government made some new laws with new criteria uh, before you can marry somebody from a foreign country, which also makes it more hard for uh, the local Dutch population <laughs> to marry somebody from Brazil or from France or from, I uh, well, from France maybe, but from, from uh, outside Europe. Okay, so this is, uh, so because of this, the problem with the, the Turkish and the Moroccans, also, the Dutch have problems now with marrying with uh, a summer love or somebody from the middle of the holiday or in the sunny term in, 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 in Latin America or Asia. So, but uh, thanks to these new, well, these new new laws, you can see that more and more Turkish and Moroccans are marrying now with somebody from in the Netherlands. But it's uh, um, they still marry mostly amongst each other, especially the, the Turks. They really really don't marry with uh, with other. Uh, Really you have to take into account. You speak about a million Dutch masters. You speak about the third Turks, the largest, almost the third Moroccans. No. And the rest, then you have the Suriname Muslims who are not a real problem because they are Ahmadiyya Muslims, which are heretics. And then you have a large mix of Afghanis, the Iraqis, Pakistanis, uh, Pakistanis uh, Iranians, Somalis who are quite violent. <laughs> uh, Sudanese. So it's a very, very heterogeneous group. From the Jewish point of view, the Moroccans are the largest problem group followed <coughs> by the Turks, and the rest is either statistically an irrelevant or average to the Dutch. Yeah. That's more or less the thing. Also, if you look at violence, not against Jews, but just the general society, like Moroccans are taking uh, Disproportion. a disproportional uh, part of the violence, of the small violence. It, uh, it's, it's ten percent in the Dutch Hills are Moroccans, while two percent are uh, they are two percent in the population. They're not talking about the youth uh, the prisons. The youth prisons it's a much higher. It's even like sixty seven percent I think is is Moroccan. But the interesting thing is here that they, uh, of course Turkish the Turks are not you don't have to consider them as big friends of Israeli Jews. They're too busy basically uh, going to, uh, studying and working. Because they have high levels, of, getting high levels of education, which is uh, not to, to be seen among the American uh, male population. The female population, women, 
so we're getting higher and higher education, and which is causing also problems for them. Is how can they find a marriage partner? So this is this is an interesting phenomenon. You can a very clear disbalance between uh, working women, working men. Men are staying completely on the educated, uh, moving st straight uh, to to prison after high school almost. But women are going to to university. Or to, or to the supermarket. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to fill. Uh, yeah. No, to, to fill the stocks. Well, the young girls are completely locked up in their in, in their in their homes, and, and, and focus themselves completely on, on studies on colleges and universities. So within I think ten to fifteen years, you'll see, you'll see like a, it will be like a, they'll I think they'll start to be separated more and more because of this education gap, which is uh, clearly developing. Uh, Shalom. Uh, the picture given by your talk is of a Dutch Jewish community which is totally passive and which everyone is isolated and we're just victims. Uh, there is no action by the Jewish community and Manfred, perhaps you can say a word about this, I mean, you've said a lot of words about it, but the real picture of what the Jewish community is, is it a typical elderly diaspora community with without any means of organizing in such a way that, for instance, American Jewish community could to resist in some way. Even on the physical level, there are things in the, there were things in the American world which it wasn't just a matter of we are the victims, we are taking this, we can do something about it. Well, I mean, that's why we're in the state of Israel, but that's a different story. But, uh, okay, short answer then, Martin, please. No. The short answer will be that the, the thing that the Dutch Jewish community does is making sure this report comes out and uh, trying to get it in the media. That's the, uh, and working on dialogue projects, education projects. That's that's the, that's.